which should tell you right off the bat that this is by far the hippest place I have ever talked. <laughs> so the first thing I would like to do is to answer a lot of the questions that I get when people find out what I do for a living. It's kind of a conversation stopper, but once people kind of get their feet back underneath them, um, I get some very common questions, and so I'd like to answer some of them today. Um, and the most common question is, well, why do we do space exploration in general? Why do we study Mars in particular? And I have a, a, a large number of answers, but I've tried to distill them down into four categories. One of the reasons we should do space exploration is because it feeds the economy. Something like $7 for every one that you have put into space exploration with your tax dollars comes back to the economy in the form of jobs, in the form of health and safety, in the form of greater productivity, and also in the form of innovation. And that's where the second one comes in. Space exploration feeds the future. The trouble with innovation is that it doesn't have a two-year cycle, a, an election cycle timeline. It has a 20-year cycle, a 30-year cycle. But that cycle is true. So my parents, who invested a great deal of their tax dollars, actually it's something like three cents for every dollar, of their tax dollars to sending people to the moon, 20, 30 years later, we had an explosion in the miniaturization of electronics. That was required for creating the electronics that had to go in the Apollo capsule. Now, if you pull out your cell phone, or if you pull out your laptop, your iPhone, your iPad, your iPod, your GPS, all of those things were possible because 20, 30 years previously, my parents put that money into our space program. And I'm hoping that the money I put in now will make my kids' lives better. And speaking of kids, space exploration can feed the soul. Now, some of you, I doubt many of you here, but some of you may have that little cynical bug in you. If you do, you are welcome to come with me anytime I speak to a fifth grade classroom. <laughs> because all I have to do is put this picture up. This is so cool! <laughs> and you know what? They're totally right. This is totally cool. And what it does for those kids is it makes them want to persevere in perhaps some subjects that they don't particularly enjoy. They want to work hard to be able to do what I do. And finally, and I think this is what most people think of, it feeds scientific inquiry. Yes, we do science in space. That's true. But that is an important thing for us to be doing. And one of the most important reasons is because we cannot understand Earth fully until we understand it in context. In the same way that a single human being cannot tell you the vast uh, range of normalcy in human beings, right? You cannot understand girls if you've never seen one, if you've only seen boys, you don't even know the right question to ask. In the same way, studying Mars, like other planets, helps us understand our own. It is important for us to remember that no matter what side of the aisle you are on in the whole global climate change debate, global warming was not discovered on Earth first, it was discovered on Venus first. And that's when we learned what questions to be asking. So, Welcome to Curiosity's home. And I do try and put this slide up here for the kids because a lot of times they get very upset when they find out Curiosity is not coming back. <laughs> but that's okay because Curiosity was designed and built to live on Mars and she is home now. So, Curiosity does science and her science objective, her main one, is to find out if Mars could have supported life like microbes. This is where curiosity is, and you can see this in context to the other places that we have studied on Mars. This is the crater she is sitting in. Gale Crater is about 
100 miles wide, a little less, you can see it has a big old mountain in it. And that um, ellipse is our landing ellipse. Now, the mountain is really important because it is actually a stack of sedimentary layers, much like the Grand Canyon. And in the same way, each of those layers was deposited within a different type of environment. So if you go up and down the layers, you begin to understand the different environments, and you begin to see up and down the Martian history. So this is where we are in that crater, and that yellow line is our traverse path. So we started in the upper right of the slide, and we moved down to the lower left. So here's Curiosity. You can see she is bristling with instruments, and I will explain some of them in a moment, but I want to give you an idea of the scale. Now, this is one of those slides that proves to you that my engineer friends do not get out much, <laughs> because this is the front of Building 264 at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Is there anything in this picture at all that will tell you the scale? Well, there's the scale. <laughs> this is a picture of me standing beside the Spirit and Opportunity mock-ups. And you can see next to that, uh, or slightly hidden there, is the Sojourner rover, those of us old enough to remember Pathfinder from 97. And then next to it is Curiosity. Curiosity is about the size and the weight of a Mini Cooper. This is my camera. I am the Deputy Principal Investigator for the MOLLE camera. MOLLE stands for Mars Hand Lens Imager. And MOLLE's job is to do exactly that, to take the pictures of the smallest grains and uh, grain relationships in the rocks and in the soils. And the reason we do that is because each of those little grains tells a story about what it's made of and how it got there. In the same way you might take a hand lens or a magnifying glass and look at a rock with that, that's what this camera is designed to do. So here is Molly on Mars, and this particular picture is near and dear to my heart, and I'll tell you why. Firstly, you can see all of these instruments on the end of the arm. Um, and you've heard that I originally moved here from Green Bay. This is actually called a cheese head. <laughs> so that makes me very happy. But you can also see Molly here, just a little cockeyed, right? That's to make her fit just a little bit better on the turret. You can see the lights shining back at us. Molly has her own flashlight, so we can actually take pictures at night. And you can see on the top, there's a cylindrical sort of thing, and that's the hinge for the dust cover that can open and close. You can see it looks kind of red. That's because Molly was facing out during entry, descent, and landing. Those of you who watched the seven minutes of terror, Molly was facing out that entire time. And so we did not know until about the 30th day of the mission whether the dust cover had survived. This is the picture that shows us it did. So, some other instruments on the rover. Curiosity has two main cameras. They're called the mast cams. Uh, different focal lengths, and there are two of them for the same reason that you have two eyes. So those of you who are brave enough, go ahead and put a finger out in front of you, right? The only person who's going to see me do this is everybody. No one's going to see you. So <laughs> close one eye and then the other, back and forth, and you'll see that your finger moves against the background that's behind it. That's stereo vision, and it's because each eye focuses slightly differently on that finger. That's why you can catch a football without it smacking you in the face. It gives you depth perception, or at least we hope you can. And we want the rover to have that depth perception, that stereo vision as well. This is those same cameras on the Martian surface. And what I've tried to do here is to show you pictures of the rover and introduce you to the rover uh, with pictures taken from the Molly camera. So you can see in that blue box, that's the mass cams. On top of that, that little hat with a mirror, that's the ChemCam. That's a different instrument. And the ChemCam is a chemistry instrument. So it doesn't just show us what the rocks look like. Its job is to show us what the rocks are made of. And it has a laser on it, right? If anybody follows, the rover actually has a Twitter account. The first time we used the laser, it was pew, pew, pew. <laughs> That's our laser, <laughs> right? So the idea there is that the laser shoots the rock 
and creates a plasma. It vaporizes the rock. Once the rock is vaporized, measuring the rock is hard unless you're smack dab on top of it. Measuring the vapor is easy. So that's the way we can figure out what these rocks are made of. This is a particularly uh, happy picture for me because this is a picture that the Molly camera took of the laser as it's working. This is the target called Nova on Sol 687. Uh, Sol is a Martian day. And you can see bright little spots there. That's the laser actually in action. These are uh, the REMS booms, and the REMS instrument is meant to give us a weather report, basically. There are two of them. You can see on the left-hand side, this is a picture from the test bed. On the right, this is a picture uh, that Molly took on Mars. And then uh, an instrument that doesn't get a whole lot of airplay is the arm itself. I'm particularly pleased with the arm because this is what allows us to do our job. And I'm just gonna let this video run a little bit while I talk to you about that. That arm is about seven feet long. It is 100 kilograms, about uh, over 200 pounds. And that arm is able to be placed to within a centimeter's accuracy. And that's really important for our camera because we don't want to be driven into the dust. We don't want to be smacking on a rock. So one of the reasons I'm including this is to show you just how complex it is for this arm to move. It's awesome. It's like watching Tai Chi. This thing has five different articulated elbows and wrists, and it just does a beautiful job. It's so cool to watch. There are three more instruments that we have that allow us to analyze rocks. Each one has a special job. The one on the left, that is the spot taken by Molly where the APXS is about to be used. That tells us chemical elements in the rock. The one in the middle, that's chemin. This is an inlet where we put samples and we are able to detect minerals, including those that are uh, formed in water. And then the one on the right, this is the SAM. This detects organics. And this is another one of those um, pictures that was extremely hard for the arm to get. Had to come all the way out, kind of twist around like this, and do some weird uh, motions to be able to capture that picture. This is my favorite picture. Uh, this is the rover cell portrait or the selfie. <laughs> and this is a particularly proud moment for me because this is the Molly camera that did it. It is 55 separate images put together done on Sol 84 to give you this beautiful picture. It's been processed, the images have been uh, 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 moved to fit and so on, but the idea here is a profound one. This is a self-portrait. This is exactly what you or I would do if we were traveling, if we were going someplace new and exciting. We would get to know the place, and we'd take our phone and, you know, <laughs> nice grin, and hi, Mom, wish you were here. This is essentially what the rover is doing for us here. And for those of you who are interested, I know I have made it because I am now part of a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Can anyone guess why? Because you can't see the arm. Can't possibly have been taken on Mars because you can't see the arm. Well, those images, there are a lot of them, and we can just kind of Photoshop the arm out by choosing the right set of images to use. So the arm is actually there. If you want to see all the images, they're on this website. <laughs> But I think the self-portrait is extraordinarily important because it reminds us that this is the day for curiosity, and curiosity is on Mars for us. Thank you.